Hello to everyone filtering in. Thank you for joining us. We're just going to give it a minute for everyone to uh, filter in, and then we're going to kick off the webinar. So uh, thank you to everyone joining us here today. Um, a very good afternoon to everyone. My name is Mohammed Al Musa, and I'm the program manager leading the Governance and Family Firms program, as well as the Governance and Tech program here at the Pearl Initiative. It is my honor and privilege to welcome you to today's webinar on leveraging culture for growth. We would like to thank our speakers in today's discussion, Christina Andreessen, Najain Al Barghouti, and Tariq Bulbul. And thank you for all of you tuning in today. Before we launch into our discussion, I'd like to start for, by first introducing the Pearl Initiative. We are the Gulf region's business-led nonprofit organization set up by Gulf regional business leaders and the United Nations Officer Partnership in 2010 to support the growth of corporate governance, stewardship, transparency, and accountability in the private sector. We would like to play a short video showcasing the Pearl Initiative and what we do. Connecting leaders from across all sectors to address these very challenges we aim to collectively design self-renewing models of collaborative governance that will ensure the vitality of the region's economies and societies for generations to come. The youth are the future workforce. They are the future leaders uh, for the businesses that fuel the growth of the region. It is a privilege to be working with the Pearl Initiative in promoting higher governance standards, something for which there is a clear regional need for. For our businesses, for our community, the more we engage the youth, the students at universities, the youth and their businesses, entrepreneurs, that is the area I think we should focus uh, going forward. You know, the Pearl Initiative started at a time where there was very little uh, information about governance and very little even uh, direction towards governance. And in the past 10 years, this has changed. The momentum is growing daily. And uh, I would just say we need to continue what we're doing. We need to increase the way we are showing how transparency can be beneficial. Thank you for all of our attendees for today's discussion. We have a fantastic webinar planned for you today with, a wonderful, with wonderful and experienced speakers. This webinar is part of a series of FinTech events run by the Pearl Initiative in the UAE and KSA and is supported by the Islamic Corporation for the Development of the Private Sector. First off, a massive thank you to our panelists, 
Christina, LeJane, and Tarek for being with us here today. We appreciate your time. And of course, thank you to all of you tuning in. We have an insightful panel lined up for you. Let me start first start by introducing our panelists. Christina is the Director of Programs at Astrolabs. Lejane al is the KSA People Experience, Culture and Sustainability Lead at Shell Hoop Group. And Tarek Bulbul is a former founder, investor, and is the General Manager at RAF Publishing, which is a subsidiary of SRMG. Before I re revert to our esteemed panelists, let's set the scene. It's no secret. In a global economy of uncertainty and instability, the GCC is, well, doing quite well, to say the least. That's and the Kingdom lot. of Saudi Arabia is experiencing tremendous growth and transformational change. In a country of over 35 million people, with a GDP per capita of over 23,000 US dollars and internet penetration of 93%, it is only logical to see a significant amount of investment poured into emerging technologies. I don't want to focus exclusively on the funding side of things, but it's important for the context of the environment and the boom we're seeing in tech in Saudi and in the region. In 2022 alone, there were 144 deals accounting for over 987 million US dollars in funding, which is up from 575 million in 2021, according to Magnet. And at the forefront of this change is financial technologies. We saw over 25 deals and over 400 million US dollars in funding in 2022, according to FinTech Global. And there are 100 FinTech startups founded in the kingdom today, 60 of which have been licensed by SEMA, the Saudi Central Bank. The kingdom and its FinTech driving entity, FinTech Saudi, have lofty ambitions and targets to hit by 2030. They're looking to have 525 FinTech players by 2030. Again, we mentioned that there are 100 by the end of 2022, with 18,000 employees serving in the industry. They are currently just under 4,000, which is up from 1,000 in 2020, according to an Endeavor Impact 46 report, and they have a GDP contribution of over 13 billion Saudi rials. Our panel today is to discuss how to leverage culture to support growth, and we will lightly touch on both the fintech and Saudi context in today's discussion. Now, some people may scoff at the idea of culture having a being a contributing factor to growth. They may say growth is about numbers and the proof is in the pudding. But if we looked a little deeper at that pudding, what if, but what if we looked a little deeper at that pudding? After all, there is that old saying, culture eats strategy for breakfast. But Enough with all of the food analogies. Here to help me unpack all of this and more are our wonderful panel of speakers. Christina, I want to start with you. And before we get into the nitty gritty, let's sort of zoom out a little bit. Uh, could you give us your perspective on the current state of the startup ecosystem in Saudi Arabia? You know, who are the key players? What do the founders need to know? And what are those opportunities and challenges that startups uh, face in their pursuit of innovation? Sure. Thank you, Mohammed, and excited to be here. Um, so since Astrolab started 10 years ago, we've really been working to build ecosystems of innovation and entrepreneurship in the region, but specifically in Saudi. Um, and whenever we try to build an ecosystem or observe an ecosystem, we look at it from multiple Lego pieces that are that are working together. So um, the players and entities we look at are firstly internal. So internal meaning the government policies, the government investment and innovation, um, the talent creators and the skilled entrepreneurs that are in, in the country actually building those companies. And then the supporting environment that they have, funders, ecosystem, the, um, the accelerator programs, um, all of the entities that help them to succeed and survive. So in terms of, of, of FinTech in Saudi, the ecosystem that exists now, we've what we've seen is a 14x increase in the last five years in companies internally going through that process. So um, the numbers that Mohammed was speaking to before showcases that really like the, the internal ecosystem, the engine is working and it's strong enough to have this crazy 14x growth um, in terms of number of companies. Then then at the same time, you have the external elements, and these are the companies and talents and innovations that are scaling into the market. Um, what we do at uh, Astrolabs, one of the things that we do is we help companies set up 
and enter Saudi. We were one of the first um, licensed um, external uh, incubators that helped foreign foreign startups scale into Saudi. So we just in that in the last three years alone, we've seen a 200% increase of companies scaling into Saudi Arabia. And of those, 28 of them are fintechs like MamoPay and Rain, uh, Payment and so on. So we definitely also see strong inflows coming into the ecosystem. All of these are signs of you know, a pretty healthy and upward related trend. What that means for entrepreneurs or for startups, just to contextualize it. Um, so if we look at like op opportunities and challenges for fintech specifically, um, I think on the, the, the first front is regulatory. Um, and what we're seeing is Sama, the Saudi Central Bank, being quite bullish in terms of the regulations that they're, that they're experimenting with or that they're introducing. Um, the open banking framework, which they just announced, one of the first in the region, um, is opening a huge amount of opportunities and doors for fintechs within Saudi. So that that alone is a huge opportunity um, for entrepreneurs. The flip side is that the regulatory does pose some challenges for fintech entrepreneurs, specifically around the minimum capital requirements that they have, which can be quite high, depending on what you're trying to do. Um, they have a lot of of regulatory when it comes to AML, KYC, um, tax, data privacy. So there is a quite a strong need to adhere to a pretty layered number of, of regulatory. So these are two things that, you know, to keep in mind. Um, the second, you know, opportunity really, I, said, I think is around funding um, because like the investment landscape in Saudi, specifically in fintech is, is booming. And the, fintech, the same fintech strategy also is trying to increase the number of VC investments to go um, to 3.2 um, from the current $3.2 billion um, up to six, sorry, sorry, to get to get to $3.2 billion from the current 647. So uh, 7 million that is, it is not right now. So there should be a huge increase in and um, funds opening up specifically to invest in fintech. And because the deal flow in the country locally is not as strong, that is also a really good opportunity for good fintechs to be able to capture and tap into that, um, that, that um, money um, and that funding. And I think the third element that is also really exciting is the consumer behavior change that we've seen in the market there. Um, we work a lot in the SME sector um, to build it. And we've seen, first of all, a big growth in the SME sector, but also a big move towards digitization in the SME sector. And similar to how the UAE saw this e-commerce wave that then powered fintech and last mile solutions um, with Saudi is going to the same thing, where we have a big uh, population of SMEs coming online, um, expecting to shift from cash and delivery to more digital payment solutions, expecting more buy now pay layers, pay later solutions, and so on. Um, and these, this is also a really exciting opportunity that fintechs can capture. Um, and then, not to mention, of course, the market size itself, with you know, you know, 30 million social media users, you know, 80% of the population being very active online. Um, all of these things contribute to a really healthy and growing market that entrepreneurs can access. You know, this is the fourth of uh, our, our series of conversations around fintech, uh, both in the UAE and Saudi. And, and every single time we do one of these, we get into the very sticky subject of regulations very quickly. Uh, in fact, our second session was specifically on regulation in the GCC. Uh, I, I, so moving on from one sticky subject in regulation to another sticky subject in, in, in culture in a corporate, um, we chose the best sort of, of the bunch, I, I think. Um, and Shell Hoop Group is quite unique in, in, in sort of their approach to uh, transformation and change and, and culture as well. So Lejane, working within Shell Hoop Group, how have you been able to cultivate the culture of innovation, uh, you know, with a family business? And what are the core values that the organization promotes? Uh, thank you, Mahmoud. Well, basically, the whole um, group started back in 1955 by Michelle and Madat who started their journey as two entrepreneurial spirits with a dream in the market. Um, they opened the first the soft city to embracing their entrepreneurial spirit. So the first core value was uh, embedded by nature in, in, in Shalhut Group, which is entrepreneurial spirit. Um, now, since I mentioned one of our values, let me answer the second part of, uh, of your question. So we have uh, respect, excellence, and entrepreneurial spirit. 
um, we strive to build this long-term relationship with our people, customers, partners, based on these values. Uh, we also place a strong emphasis on uh, sustainability and the social responsibility, uh, like uh, fine tech, for example, it's, uh, fully um, uh, in a way under social responsibility, uh, responsibility with um, initiatives uh, focused on reducing our environmental impact, giving back to our communities. So these basically are um, our core values in the group. Now, going back on the ways we have been able to uh, cultivate a culture of innovation is mainly through um, um, encouraging collaboration as it's a, an essential part of entrepreneurship. Uh, we encourage our people to work uh, collaboratively, share ideas, seek feedback from their colleagues. This helps to create an environment that is uh, conducive to innovation. Uh, in addition, maybe to promoting uh, collaboration, as I mentioned, uh, we also place a strong emphasis on uh, continuous learning and development, as we believe it's essential for fostering an entrepreneurial mindset. Uh, we, we have established a good university to provide our people with access to training programs, workshops, other resources to help them develop their skills and stay up to date uh, with the latest uh, industry trend. Um, also maybe having an, uh, a diverse teams encourage much deeper conversation as a wider set of skills, backgrounds uh, and uh, ideas uh, that for sure uh, affected innovation more positively. Um, uh, of course, let's not forget our Abtikar uh, program, which is uh, exclusive to our people, uh, where they can submit ideas, potential to make significant impact uh, on our business. Uh, unlike our uh, Greenhouse Accelerator prog uh, program, uh, it started back in 2018. Um, it's for uh, external, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, uh, people that allowed us to gain um, early exposure, uh, if you would like to say, to innovate, uh, disrupt retail trends that are emerging globally. Um, at last, but uh, maybe we have the the, la the last one is the beauty brand uh, brand incubator program. Uh, under this, this is the newest uh, program that we have, and under this program. We are looking for innovative and uh, disruptive uh, emerging beauty brands from the MENA region. Um, and uh, yeah. Fascinating. You know, I, I, like I said, we chose the best of the bunch at Shalhoub. I don't think we have too many of those use cases uh, in the region with corporates uh, really pushing uh, these sorts of uh, values and culture within their organization. Tariq, you've, you've seen all of this, you know, you've, you've started your career in corporate, you've, you've delved in as a founder, you've been an investor, uh, now you're, you're back as a uh, working within a corporate organization. Um, but I, I really want to kind of touch on your experience as a founder um, and an investor. Uh, can you reflect on the significance of culture within a startup and, and how may that contribute to growth? I mean, look, it's always a, um, it, it, I mean, the question is, uh, I mean, the answer could be, I'm going to try and keep it um, concise because when you're talking about, I mean, culture in a startup, today I, I work in an organization and the company that I'm kind of the co I'm kind of the founding general manager for this company within SRMG, the Saudi Research and Media Group. So it's like a startup that's corporately corporate backed. Um, so um, fully owned, fully backed by SRMG. So um, and and I realize that I think one of the most important um, kind of values um, that you look at in the in a, in a startup or as a founder, even if whether it's in a corporate backed, whether it's venture backed, whether it's whether it's um, backed by angels or just um, it's a startup that you're um, kind of fully backing yourself as a founder, it's really transparency. Um, I think is is one is is the first things transparency with your team, um, because by virtue of of being of of because to succeed you need to have strong people around you. You need to be able to kind of have a clear vision that your team needs to buy in. Um, you know we, 
I, I realize that people working for startups, whether they're venture backed or backed by big corporates, even if it's large and fully very well uh, with, with corporates very that have deep pockets, is that the your, your the employees that work there um, tend to always need kind of reassurance that um, things are on the right path. Um, they know that they're taking a risk. Uh, being there rather than being in an established organization. They know that they're going to have to double down harder, work longer, um, put more effort, and, 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 and there's more blood and sweat when you're in building a startup. So I think transparency is key. They understand the trajectory. They understand how things are going. They understand what's the status of funding. They understand, they have, so they feel that kind of security from a job perspective. Um, they're, they, they really feel that they... Um, are very vested into the into, uh, or are very are trusted and they have the autonomy to do things, um, and and really understand and are bought into the vision, um, and uh, uh, and also and I think what's also very important is that you treat a startup as a corporate in a way without getting dog, 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 you know getting stuck in the corporate stuff. So I think having clear processes and all that just because you're a startup doesn't mean um, you don't need to. You can just be kind of a we just be very spontaneous. If that's not the case. That's one thing I learned going from corporate to startup to corporate um, and being an investor in between and talking to founders of others because I did private equity and venture capital. So I've, I've kind of worked with established organizations uh, or, or founders within established organizations or founders within emerging uh, or startups. So what you realize is the, the startups that have a very strong value system that really speak um, uh, or communicate clearly to their people. Um, and um, and kind of really operate um, in a process oriented manner tend to be the ones that kind of um, have the best uh, kind of uh, uh, you know can have the best path to success. You know, I'm glad you brought that up. I've I've, I've worked in startups myself, and 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 part of that is is a daily anxiety, right? You, yes. You kind of understand going into it theoretically what that looks like, but once you're living it every day is, is sort of this uh, feeling of, okay, what does this day going to bring? And, and what are those, what kind of crisis is going to come up? You know, last week we saw with SVB um, going exactly. through its own moment and, and who would have thought. Um, and I think a big part of that is what you spoke about in terms of transparency to say that, you know, yes, that anxiety does exist, but we have to acknowledge it and understand that that's part of that journey. Um, so, Talking about those who, who support startups, uh, Christina, I'm curious to know how Astrolabs facilitates that connection between startups and corporates. And uh, would you be able to provide some examples of how, some of those successful collaborations uh, that have resulted from these efforts? Sure. So just like, as Tarek said, moving between startup world and corporate world is, is tough for employees. It's probably even harder for startup founders that want to make money <laughs> from those corporates. Um, but that being said, you know, B2B is one of the most profitable business models for a reason. And B2E especially, especially um, can be massively uh, um, opportunistic for companies. So even though it's a, it's a complicated and tough journey, that the rewards are pretty high. So um, something that we at Astrolabs do a lot is we run what we call fast pilots, um, where we work primarily with the corporate first um, as, as the buyer, and we work with them to understand their strategy, um, their innovation goals, their market capture goals, um, and really um, try to pinpoint what are the areas of value, um, of innovativeness that startups can add to that corporate. Once we've identified those areas, um, we build kind of like ideal personas um, that that could work to run pilot programs with the corporate. And then we go into the market regionally or globally, and we search for the best um, companies that could fit or could match the needs of that corporate. And then we work with the startup to prepare them for an integration proposal um, where they actually propose what this integration would look like. And then we hold some kind of event where the companies are pre presenting to the business heads and showcasing how their products can really solve the company's um, challenges or help them to achieve their innovation goals. And then the company can then choose which ones they wanna go move forward uh, with in a more formal partnership. And then they go into a pilot phase, they run a pilot together to demonstrate the value and the effectiveness of the startups um, uh, product, but also the capacity to service corporates because it's also quite hard to, to achieve sometimes. And then from there, they can go into a fully fledged commercial agreement. 
And this by steps all of the procurement hurdles that typically weed out really good companies that are not big um, and gives them direct access to decision makers that can um, actually integrate their products within their companies. Um, so some examples of things that work well for this um, uh, is companies that are actually entering the market. Um, so we helped a, a very large U.S. prop tech company to be able to scale into the region by help, by landing Majid al Futain as their anchor client. Um, I, and on Majid al Futain's side, they, we were able to provide them with really effective new um, indoor air indoor air quality monitoring systems um, that no one else in the market had. So for Majid al Futain, this ticked the box of innovativeness, um, energy reduction, um, and cleaner air. And the company was able to have a working model that proved that their technology could work in the Middle East weather conditions, and then get that first anchor client that allowed it to be in the region. So we, it was a win-win in that way. Or another example is um, we ran a, a very big retail challenge with Majid al Futain to find brands um, that are small brands, you know, you know, small businesses that have interesting and cool products that Majid al Futain wants to stock on Care for or in um, in that concept store. And um, where well, these small brands have no way to actually access them or haven't even considered of a retail concept because they're online first. So by having this matchmaking, we were able to, for example, help uh, a really cool beauty brand from Egypt scale into the GCC. Now that one of the Majid al Futain's top performers in their beauty category um, and access that whole client base and Majid al Futain could access their client base, which also is a different persona. So these are examples of ways that um, there, there can be really strong success stories from startups working with corporates, but there needs to definitely be some matchmaking in the middle to help translate the language of each other so that that can be a successful partnership. I really relate to what you're speaking about, you know, that procurement process can be quite cumbersome for, for startups. And I, I remember um, when I used to work with startups, trying to incorporate them into, uh, you know, a corporate environment, um, I, I would have to really like push to 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 get everyone to understand what we're trying to do, and I remember later what one of the founders told me was, you know, we used you as an internal champion, and that was part of our go-to-market strategy. Now, uh, Lejane, you ideally you want to kind of shift that culture, right? And you want, like you mentioned, um, for 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 entrepreneurial spirit to be a value within the organization. But when you're looking at the day-to-day -day work, how do you encourage? employees to foster innovation beyond just sort of those uh, quote-unquote innovation projects? Um, well, as, as uh, Tariq mentioned, um, there is definitely uh, the encouraging uh, the creativity and risk-taking. Eventually, uh, we encourage our people to, to, to think creatively, take uh, calculated risks, of course, uh, we believe that innovation cannot be achieved uh, without taking risks and trying out new ideas. Um, therefore, we do provide our people with supportive environments that encourage uh, uh, experimentation and innovation. Um, on the other side, uh, we also promote uh, ownership. We encourage people to, to take ownership of their ideas. We believe that uh, when our people feel this, they are more likely to take initiatives and drive innovation. Um, um, basically, if um, if you are an employee who looks to foster innovation beyond the specific uh, innovation project, uh, I believe uh, personally it's about uh, staying uh, curious, uh, always be uh, curious to and open uh, to new ideas. Uh, take the, the, the time to learn about uh, different industries, technologies, uh, attend conferences, webinars, um, maybe also to uh, being a problem solver, uh, some critical thinking, uh, look for opportunities to solve problems, stretch yourself, get out of the comfort zone uh, to, and create value. Uh, take initiatives and um, not to be uh, afraid to, to take uh, the, the risk. Also, building relationship. Um, uh, uh, Christina just mentioned how important building relationships uh, with colleagues, clients, partners uh, can help you to gain new perspectives and insights. Uh, it can help you to find new opportunities, um, basically. So, uh, 
all this would fall under uh, the fear that we, we don't jump into taking these um, these pillars. So embracing fa failure as well, <clears throat> excuse me, fail failure is an invincible part of innovation. Uh, I'm sure uh, Tari and Christina <clears throat> would also uh, maybe relate to that. Uh, learning to embrace it and, and use it as an opportunity to learn and, and grow. So it's all about not being afraid to take risks and try again and again and again. Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, sometimes those old tropes, they, they, they say it best, you know, uh, there's nothing to fear more than fear itself. Um, and, and, and fear is, is a daily occurrence in a startup. Uh, and, and Tarek, you know, we, we touched on these things, but uh, let's go back to food, you know, and, and let's go back to pudding, actually. Um, so this pudding of culture, uh, what are the essential elements for building a strong culture within a startup? You know, and how do these principles uh, guide interactions with with larger corporates? You know, like how do we put that secret sauce together uh, and get these large corporates to feel like we're trustworthy? That that you know the fear that they might have um, trying to, to to partner with us, we, we alleviate that pain. You know, I think when it, when it comes to interaction with corporates, and I mean when you're a startup. And you know, B2B, as was mentioned, is, is so key. You know, you always want to latch on to a corporate in the, in the early stage of your start or at any stage of being a start, because that's where your core business can come from. And that's, the, that's your sandbox where you can kind of learn and, and build something that becomes then scalable for the consumer market. If you look at, I mean, Microsoft, Microsoft was built on the back of, of selling of, of IBM being their first customer. And that then that propelled them to the stratosphere. And if you look at, I mean, so so I think one of the main elements of a successful culture is really execution. I think execution is so important. Um, personally, I see it lacking a lot of times in startups or even in, in companies where you get either first uh, by virtue of being a, of being a founder, we tend to some tend to sometimes live in the clouds, and 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 you're attracting people just like you are as excited and as dreamy as you that want to come and build that vision, but sometimes you can get stuck in, in dreaming or over planning or over processing. And that's another kind of negative thing you can bring in from corporate to startup is bringing this over processing things and getting stuck in having this analysis paralysis and stuck in meetings and PowerPoints and stuff like that, and just missing what's important. So I think the culture of ex execution is so critical, so important, this, you know, being thorough um, and delivering because that's when a corporate will really feel that they're making, they're getting value from you and then you can upsell them. Then they can actually tell you, you know what, I want to, I want to do this, this, and that. I want to build this kind of product. Seems you can do that. So, you know, there's some transferable skills here. Can you do that for me? So you end up growing as an organization with that client, with that corporate. Um, and if you're flexible and open-minded, you, you might realize that you're pivoting as a business as well. And you're not trying to just be stuck to where you are. So I think, yeah, I, I think execution, execution, execution. One of the first books I remember um, when I was in corporate, uh, maybe 13 years ago, 14 years ago, our vice president at the time got us this book called Execution. Um, and uh, and at the time, what he was trying to embed in us is this mentality of, of executing things. And that was in the corporate. And then, and I, I kind of carry that with me because sometimes I, as a founder, and, even, and I mean, even right now I'm in corporate, I'm not a founder, but... I'm, I, you, you always are dreaming. You always are thinking of things in a way. And even if you work in corporate, you feel like it's your company. You know, sometimes I act like SRMG is fine. It's not a, so you always kind of have that mentality where you are always, you feel this strong ownership and passion for things, but you know, you must not forget that you really need to execute and, and close loops and get things done and, and deliver. So I think I would say execution um, times 10. I remember uh, trying to build something in the mid the very beginning of the pandemic and, and uh, you know, every day we used to wake up and you're just stuck at home uh, and thinking, oh my God, you know, I'm trying to overcome just these these crazy thoughts, you know, like where are we going in the world? And, and then remembering, oh no, I, if, if I don't build this thing, then, you know, at the end of the day, there would have been no progress. So I completely agree with this execution okay. thing. Um, but before we go on to our next question, uh, uh, this this living in in the clouds thing, um, it it reminded me of a session, another fintech session that we did, where we had a founder who was adamant 
that governance is not important for fintechs. Mm. Uh, and it, it kind of blew my mind and blew the mind of the speakers as well on the day. Uh, and, and I think that kind of contributes towards that, that idea of separation between um, the dream world of the startup and then the reality of, of, of uh, what you will face when you try to, to work with corporates. And I, and I want to, and I'm introducing this here because I'm going to sort of, when we end the session, uh, come to all of you and ask you that very quick question of growth versus governance. Uh, and just curious to see what your thoughts are on that. Um, but but going back to you know how do startups work with with corporates, uh, Christina, I understand that Astrolabs helps corporates create their own innovation programs, you know, accelerator incubator programs. Um, you've previously worked with Shell Hoop Group, for example, and to support them in their uh, Ibtikar and, and greenhouse initiatives. Um, can you share any success stories that illustrate the benefits for both corporates and startups? Um, so actually the um to to Lu Jane's point about the entrepreneurial nature of Shell Hoop, um our relationship with Shell Hoop actually got a had a pretty good start um when we had the first meeting with the CEO and we didn't have to explain to him why working with startups was a good idea, which is typically what you have to do with most most corporates. You need to start off with this is all the benefits that you could potentially get by working with a startup. But it, with, with him, it was first off, same page. I know why this is important. I know that we're aligned with how we can benefit from it. So then now let's just talk about execution. And that kind of top-down mentality was really what led to the success of the Greenhouse Accelerator because it was um, top management who truly saw the benefit of that, that, that these founders can bring to their business. Um, and then pushing the other brands and be business units under them to be able to have that adoption. Um, now, the, getting that adoption across the organization is always like the first challenge. Um, and and you need to have like the first the first cohort is always a bit more painful than the rest <laughs> because you're breaking down those walls and trying to get buy in from everyone. Um, and we always see that. Um, but but over the course of the three cohorts that we ran with um, Shalhu before handing it over to them to run internally, um, we were able to get um, 17 companies to participate, and that resulted in 16 proof of concepts um, and 10 commercial agreements actually signed. Um, and, and the final result of that is that nine brands ended up using the startup solutions, and three of the tech platforms were adopted across the group level. So uh, after the first you know, first round, seeing that first success and the impact that these companies were making on the brands, then we got more and more buy-in um, within the organization as we went along, um, and more people, more requests from other business units to participate, more brands who wanted to, you know, meet the companies and, and participate in the program, and that momentum is really what you need um, to, to actually, like, have this continual change. This program started in 2018, it's still ongoing, it's still a success. It's still driving Shell Hoop's innovation uh, track. So, um, uh, and I know that at least three or four companies that came into the region and are now like, you know, building the, the fashion tech or the retail tech um, um, industries of the Middle East through that program. So, so what you definitely need is that first like strong visionary who pushes the culture down throughout the organization, and then really like you know this long term intention to stay and to keep investing and to keep pushing, and that you, and then you get these you know great results. And I know that the greenhouse is like a case study now that's used by consultants across the region for an innovative program that really worked. And these are the reasons why it did so. Uh, you know, we're, we're talking about innovation at Selhub and and. Uh, Lejean, I want to understand from you, what, what should founders, um, you know, when they think about working with the corporate, what should they try to understand about the cultural dynamics within large corporates uh, when they're trying to present these ideas or they're trying to collaborate with them? And, and how can they use that understanding to create successful partnerships? Well, um, actually, I believe that, uh, as Christina said, startup founders should understand that large corporations often have their own established country, the values, uh, ways of doing things. Uh, this includes uh, factors such as a hierarchical structure, um, a, fo a focus on risk management, um, and as a result, it can be really challenging for startups to collaborate with uh, large corporates and, and get their ideas heard. Like we're very proud and, and um, very happy to hear this from Christina 
we are blessed to have uh, Patrick Shalhoub as our <clears throat> CEO, who who who, ha who is a visionary person. Like, uh, but basically, to to create a successful partnership, uh, startups should aim to uh, understand and navigate the, these culture dynamics. So remember, um, we, we, I mentioned curiosity. But maybe, as also Christina mentioned, do your research before approaching a, a, a large corporate. It's always important to, to do your research, understand the values, priorities, the, the current project that uh, the organization is, is working on. Uh, this eventually will help you tailor your pitch uh, to, to their specific needs and increase the chances of, of your success. Um, uh, eventually, uh, the startup is seeking to build a long-lasting relationship with this organization. And uh, relationships, as also I mentioned before, is key to success in the corporate world. So take the time to build a relationship with um, key decision-making, for example. Be patient. Uh, large co corporates often, we, we, we do know that we move slowly, like any other corporate. So it can take time to, to, to get your ideas heard and, and, and gain the attraction. Uh, so be patient and persistent. Um, uh, be uh, prepared to invest time and resources into building this relationship. Uh, uh, and uh, um, maybe the last uh, point, I, I guess Tari also mentioned it about being flexible, agile. Uh, because large corporates may have different priorities and ways of working than startups. So uh, be prepared to be uh, flexible and adapt your approach based on the needs. Um, and, and, and maybe last but not least, focus on, on, on value. Ultimately, the key to success is in, in any partnership is to, is to focus on, on delivering value. So execution, 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 and also uh, um, focusing uh, on value, I guess. So by understanding and navigating the culture uh, dynamics within this large corporate, uh, I believe startup founders can create a successful partnership uh, that benefits both parties. As, as we head into Ramadan, I think we all uh, will start to try and practice uh, patience as a virtue, not just startup founders. Uh, Tarek, um, you know, it's kind of on a similar vein, you know, you've, uh, from your time as a founder, um, what, 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 what are those insights that you've carried into your role as an investor, uh, and then subsequently, subsequently working in publishing and, and what kind, what advice might you have for founders, uh, who, who are trying to work with corporates? I think stay real. Um, uh, you, you realize a lot of people leave corporate um, and then go to start something on their own. They kind of are kind of sick of corporates, uh, of being in the corporate world and kind of become anti-corporate in their mind and, and decide not to work alongside and with corporates. And I think that could tend to be, a, that could be a mistake because there's a lot of value you can get from working with, with corporates, whether it's getting business from them, whether it's, uh, it's uh, innovating neck along, along with them. And I think that's very relevant in the FinTech uh, sector. Um, so I think, you know, um, I mean, one of the main insights is really just being open-minded, um, being, you know, just being grounded and open-minded and, and really, I think, respecting the talent and the people you have who, um, who uh, instead of working in places that are maybe a bit more structured and organized and, and, and have stronger governance, they've decided to come in and work with you. Um, I mean, some of them might just come in for, for it as a transition, you know, but I mean, you can really lock them in and have them there for the long term. Um, and for that to happen, you really kind of have to have a strong value system um, that uh, really respects revenue and profitability, if I can say. Um, and that comes a lot from working with corporates because you kind of end up having to adopt that kind of mentality as well. And uh, so kind of m meshing the... The, the the vision and and the kind of that that dream and that innovation and all that with with actual um, delivering actual uh, an actual customer product an actual product that people want to pay for and not just want to use profitability is absolutely key oh man, that's, uh, i mean that's i mean that's that's the number one thing if i think that's something that a lot of people miss 
how else we make revenue, then you ask about the margins, the margins are not there, the profitability will never come. And, and with SVB now, um, and all that happening, I think that just reinforces that that importance. And governance, because you talked about governance, and I think governance is, is, is critical. The only reason why I think today the banking sector in the U.S. has not collapsed and why people are able to get some of their money back is because of regulation and because of governance in the U.S. So, you know, I think governance and regulation is key. And if and as a company, I think you would you will see the value of it down the line, but trying to adapt to it is hard and trying to work with, especially if you're in fintech, if you're in health tech, if you're in biotech, there's a lot of regulation you need to work with. But I think if you're raising funding, you need to cater to that. You need to make sure you have a team that can work and, and focus on making sure you're, 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 um, you're compliant. And at the same time, um, you it gives you enough runway to kind of, because things are just longer leads in several in separate in specific sectors. So, yeah. So let's say, you know, you're a founder and you've, taken the advice of Lejayan and you've taken the advice of Tarek and you've taken the advice of Christina um, and you've gone to VCs and you've raised, you know, a beautiful Series C uh, and you see Saudi Arabia is booming. You're ready to scale. So Christina, could you share with us how Astrolab supports founders in their journey to set up in Saudi Arabia and, and how do you help them navigate that process? Sure. Um, so setting up in Saudi Arabia is significantly more complicated than doing so in the UAE. Um, and there's also significantly higher capital requirements as well that you need to consider. Um, plus, there is um, pretty strong regulations that um, is, is not favorable to some kind of businesses coming from the outside and doing business in Saudi. So there's multiple layers that you need to consider before thinking of this investment um, and make sure that it's the right choice for you and and it's it's a feasible path to to success you know i i know every startup deck in the probably in the region when vcs ask them which country they're going to go into next they always put saudi because it's the biggest market um but the actual like logistics of it is slightly more complicated um so what we have um we have a very large company setup team. Um, as mentioned, like we've had a 200% growth over the year. So over the last three years, so we've invested a lot in this space. Um, we were one of the really early players um, that was able to um, be a foreign incubator that actually helped companies from abroad scale in the startup space, scale into Saudi um, with much reduced uh, capital requirements if they are innovative and venture backed and so on. So there is you know, a pretty good path for companies that really have innovative offerings. Um, and that had venture backing to be able to actually access um, to the Saudi market without having to pay the same capital requirements as regular traditional companies. So they, there is a pretty clear advantage for startups there if you can prove that you are truly bringing innovation into the market. So what our team will support you to do is to, um, you know, help you to know first if you qualify. Um, and then um, there's about 16 steps um, that you have to go through to be able to set up in Saudi. So we help essentially do them for you, um, uh, do the paperwork and so on, um, including the visa processing and everything like that. Um, something to keep in mind as well that once you skate, once you're in Saudi, you need to have an office space, you need to hire quite immediately a team on the ground, including a Saudi GM. Um, so these are all things that we support um, companies to do. Um, so um, we have a very large co-working space in Saudi, which serves as a soft landing office. We also have talent services that can hire the first teams, um, specifically the first Saudi um, employees that you need to have. Um, and, and, then, and then we work once you're in the market we work to give you you know introductions access to opportunities um and kind of also advise a bit in terms of your entry strategy as well so um but the first step is really um our team is more than happy to talk you through options see what licenses is best for you fintechs will take longer because if depending on what their business model is there's a sama regulatory step that needs they need to go through so these are all things that um, our team has been doing for the last six, seven years, and, and I will be able to support any founder scaling into Saudi to do. Just as a follow-up question for that, um, can you explain what a, a soft landing is and, and, and who those soft landing partners are in Saudi Arabia? So yeah, soft landing is basically accessing to uh, an office that you don't have to 
do a yearly payment on. It's just monthly payments. Um, MVP version of your team. So the minimum minimal number of seats that you need um, to keep your costs really low at the beginning until you know the market better um, and, and can assess what the best office that's set up for you is in the future. So basically it's really trying to keep your um, your office, your you have to have an office. So it's keeping those costs very low and very flexible um, by headcount and not by you know square meter so that we can so that you can be um, you can be flexible and keep your keep your um, precious uh, venture capital lasting as long as possible. Thank you. Uh, we, we we kind of touched on governance and and Lejane, um, part of the, the the let's say the increased focus around governance these days is is uh, the S and the and the ESG. So how important is sustainability uh, to today's workforce, and how do you incorporate it uh, into the culture at Shalhoub? Um, well, Mahmoud, sustainability is becoming um, Muhammad, sorry. Uh, sustainability is becoming increasingly important in today's workforce. It's essential for any business to incorporate sustainable practices into their culture. For Shalhoub, sustainability is ingrained into everything we do. So we believe that it's our responsibility as an organization to contribute to the sustainability of the communities in which we operate in. To this end, we have established a framework that guides our approach to sustainability across all the um, areas of our business, uh, including in operations, uh, products, our services, uh, even our uh, leadership style and relationship with partners. Um, for example, uh, establishing a, a sustainability department, we have a dedicated sustainability team uh, that oversees our sustainability initiatives and ensures and that we are in aligned with uh, the SDGs. Um, and if we take from an ESG uh, perspective, we have uh, our sustainability strategy is based on three pillars, which is a planet, people, and partners. So in the E under uh, uh, environmental, we have set clear sustainability goals of our business, including reducing our carbon emissions, increasing our use of renewable energy, improving the sustainability of our products and supply chains. Um, under the social pillar, we believe that sustainability is everyone's uh, responsibility. So basically, we have engaged our people by providing uh, trainings, uh, awareness session, education session on sustainability, and, and also encourage them to get involved in uh, sustainability CSR uh, initiatives. Uh, governance, as we talked about governance uh, pillar, we have established partnership with key stakeholders, whether suppliers, uh, customers, also NGOs, of course, to collaborate on sustainability initiatives in order to share best practices. Uh, last but not least, Tariq mentioned transparency. Uh, so we have it through uh, tracking, reporting. Uh, basically, this is one of the key pillars in sustainability where we have made uh, all the efforts to make uh, the, our sustainability report public. Um, and uh, it, it, it can give you uh, detailed information on our sustainable goals, initiatives, and progress. So uh, for all uh, the, the um, uh, who's listening here and trying to open their own business, uh, by uh, incorporating sustainability uh, into your culture, um, you're not only contributing to the sustainability of our communities, but also creating uh, a more engaged and motivated workforce that is committed to making a positive impact in the world. So, um, yes, I truly believe that sustainability should definitely be embodied in the culture of any uh, startup. Again, after three years, still muting ourselves. Uh, Barak needs to jump off, so before he... Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me and to my co-panelists. Uh, thank you for your inspirational answers and would love to connect with anyone who's in Riyadh um, at any point. Take thank care. You, Bye. Pleasure. Thank you so much, Tarif. 
Uh, we have five minutes left. Uh, if anyone in the audience has any questions, um, if not, I do want to get our panelists' uh, thoughts on growth versus governance. Uh, it's it's been it's been uh, you know uh, on my mind ever since, uh, and, and I'd, I'm very keen to get your thoughts on that. So my take on it is you need to have growth first before you can have governance. Uh, if you optimize first for governance and make sure everything's perfect, um, you probably won't get the growth because you will kill everything at the start. Um, so I think growth needs to happen first. There needs to be definitely like governments, governments in place to implement once that growth happens. Um, but I mean, from a startup's perspective, um, it's much easier for startups to spend time thinking about their boards and reporting lines instead of talking to customers. So it's kind of like a, a way to, to kill yourself early. Um, so definitely don't recommend optimizing from a startup perspective on governance before growth. Once you do have that growth in place, especially for fintechs, um, you know, we've seen the opposite side of the dark side of it with the crypto companies that had very fast growth and very little governance and that didn't work for anyone. So um, that growth needs to be put in place and you need to kind of hire that professional management layer. layer. Um, but definitely don't do that at the outset. Um, I was a fintech founder. I did founder. I did that, and it um, killed my runway and um, distracted me from talking to customers. So, make sure that you have product market for first, product market fit first. Make sure that you do have a product which works, and then you can start thinking about governance. I honestly wouldn't have uh, said it better. So, Christina really uh, put it in a nutshell and simplified the whole thing. So, keep it simple, guys. Start with maybe thriving rather than growing because uh, the word growing is uh, increasingly growing the anxiety in us. So maybe just the only difference to, to keep thriving ra rather than growing before you can put it in. Excellently put from, from both of our panelists. And I want to thank you both for your time today. Uh, Tarek joined us uh, from his, his, his holiday and Christina is joining us as her uh, second session of the day. Uh, you did great in the first uh, in the morning uh, as, as a judge. And, and also, of course, thank you so much to Lejane uh, for, for her insights and her time. Um, if we don't have any more questions from the audience, I think we can close it out. If you have any uh, last thoughts that you want to share, um, please, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Hamad. Thank you for having us. And uh, best of luck to uh, all the, uh, the startups out there. It's a great time, I believe, in Saudi Arabia to be a startup. It is challenging, competitive, and uh, but it's definitely the right place and the right time. So. Uh, yes, it was uh, a super interesting discussion. Um, definitely, I think. One thing to take away from all of this um, is that, uh, you know, whatever we're doing to grow, it requires really like a long game and, you know, playing the long game consistent, consistently investing in culture. Culture is a long term investment. Um, so these things are like going into a culture transformation journey takes a long time and takes, you know, years. And I think Saudi Arabia is now seeing the results of many years of, of continued investment. So I think um, just to kind of close off, like anything that has to do with changing culture requires a lot of time and a lot of consistency. Before Thank you, Christina. Yeah. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, Lejain. And thank you to Tarek. And thank you for all of you tuning in today. And uh, we hope to see you soon on one of our future events. From everyone at Pearl Initiative, thank you and good evening. Thank you. Bye.